G'day, g'day, g'day. This is John Mackay, the Creation Guy, and we're sitting in the boardroom of the Creation Museum in northern Kentucky in the USA, and with me is my old colleague Ken Ham, who is the President and CEO of Answers in Genesis. G'day, mate. Hey, John. Great to have you here. It's good to see you again. It's a long time since you and I hit the road in Australia trying to convince people about the evidence of creation, Noah's Flood, and the Tower of Babel. Well, it sort of seems like millions of years ago, doesn't it? Personally? Well, not, not maybe quite millions, long, but yeah. we are both looking a little older. Mm -hmm. But what were you doing before I came across you? Well, actually, I was a science teacher. I know you were a teacher too, uh, but I was a science teacher in the public schools. My first appointment was in Dolby, and it was there in Dolby that I first started to really... I uh, get interested in this whole issue of creation evolution. The Lord had really laid a path before that in interactions I'd had with people and so on. And really it goes back to being brought up in a Christian home with a father and mother. Well, let me just interrupt you before we go there. You were in Dolby in a private school or a... No, this is a public school. And I was a science school? teacher in the public school Okay, in and Dolby. in fact, that's how I came across you because I'd been in a really exclusive private school right. and developing that. a creation curriculum and a man called Gordon Jones. Remember Dr. Jones? Well, I remember Dr. Jones. In fact, he was the one that first told me about a book called The Genesis Flood. Uh -huh. And I was going to the same church he was going to in Brisbane at the time uh, when I was going to university. In fact, in my fourth year, I went to Queensland University to get a diploma in education so I could be a science teacher. And he had heard that I was interested in this whole creation evolution issue. Before that, I'd found a little booklet from England that really sparked my interest in a big way because I, I hadn't really had any answers to the whole issue of millions of years evolution. In this little book I read, how can you have death and disease and suffering before sin? So how could you have all these fossils uh, that in the fossil record has evidence of diseases and, and death and animals eating each other and so on? How could that be before sin when it's with Adam's sin came death and the whole world groans because of Adam's sin? And so I had that little book but really didn't have any detailed answers. And he told me about this book uh, about the flood by Dr. Henry Morris and Dr. Wickham. And I went into what was then the Gospel Book Depot in Brisbane and found they actually had a copy. Now listen, I knew nothing about this from, from Dr. Jones, but I did know one thing. He was a brilliant lecturer in education and I had become a Christian and developed a course and I asked him, can you tell me about any other Christian teachers involved in science so that we can send this course to them and get their input? And your name was right up near the top. So that's I interesting. contacted uh, uh -huh. you know, Ken Ham at Dolby. Mm -hmm. that, that's not exactly a big town, is it? No, it's not a big town. It's a farming community actually. Kangaroo down the main but, street? Uh, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now and then. <laughs> now listen, uh, I was sort of starting up a group for teachers. Mm -hmm. You were out in the country. Had you run any creation seminars yet? No. In fact, the first talk I ever gave uh, dealing with the creation evolution issue in the book of Genesis was when I was at Dolby in that uh, first year. We were going to the Baptist church there, and they had what were called youth exchanges in those days. And that's where the youth from one church in the country would go and take services for a church in the city, and then the city church youth would do the same in the country. And they asked me if I would lead this group. And I thought, wow, if I'm going to lead this group, you know, and I'm a teacher, what am I going to do? And I thought, I was asked to take the sermon, and this was in a church uh, with a pastor named Alan Cosgrove, uh, Petrie Terrace Baptist mm -hmm. in Brisbane. And so uh, I decided to do a sermon on the creation evolution issue. And so I had a few books at that stage that I'd obtained and I summarized different arguments and so on. And that was the first talk I ever gave on the whole creation evolution issue. Interestingly, there was a man sitting in the congregation called Steve Gustafson who was there with a big smile on his face the whole time. And afterwards I, I talked to him and he was so interested in what we were doing and he became one of the board members of our ministry. In fact, he was remember. a lawyer, wasn't he? He was. And oh, he's okay. the one that set up legally for us how to start. The, the creation he ministry. did indeed. And the interesting thing is you mentioned Alan Cosgrove and you were running a seminar for him. Now I knew Alan from a totally different perspective because I hadn't become convinced about creation till well after I'd finished university and hence the contact with Dr. Jones and you. But I was also from a musical background and so we had a music group and Alan Cosgrove, who was outreaching to the down and outs and the, the people who'd never heard the gospel, he would regularly have our group come along. And of course, the interesting thing is half of my group ended up going out to the mission field, leaving me that isn't much of a group. And people said, well, you're Mr. Science. What about dinosaurs? What about creation? So it's interesting how God brings similar people with similar purposes. So there's Alan Cosgrove, Steve Gustafson, there's you and me, and God's bringing us all together. Yeah. You mentioned before about your family. 
What role has your family and your education played in your commitment to this subject, Creation, Evolution, Noah's Flood? Well, you know, John, here at the Creation Museum, uh, downstairs, uh, it's really a two-story museum that's built into a hill, but downstairs, as after people have gone through the main part of the museum, there's a little exhibit, has a photo of my father and mother, and a little Noah's Ark that my father built me many years ago, and my father's Bible with all these notes in it. He went to be with the Lord about 18 years ago. And the reason that exhibit's there is because it challenges people. What legacy are you leaving your children? Really, the Ministry of Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum, the Coming Ark Encounter Project, it's really all a legacy of parents who taught their children to stand boldly, unashamedly, and uncompromisingly on the authority of the Word of God. You know, my father's a teacher, and his father's a teacher, and his father's a teacher, and, you know, that goes back, back, back. But uh, my father's a teacher, but he was also one who was very bold about his faith. And he loved preaching in church as a lay preacher, but he was always answering the liberal critics of the day. You know, in those days, the liberal critics, uh, like in Australia, were saying, you know, the miracles in the Old Testament could be explained away by natural events and so on, and the feeding of the 5,000 was just a boy setting a good example. And my father heard these arguments, even from churches that we attended, and he was all the time answering those. He was really an apologist, and it's interesting. He never used the word apologetics, but looking back on it, that's what he was doing. He was teaching us as kids, by example, to be able to defend the Christian faith and give answers for what we believe. 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer, to give an apologia is the Greek word, which means uh, a logical reason defense of the faith. Now, my father was exactly the opposite, very anti-church, very anti-Christian, very pro-Charles Darwin. And I guess if, if he had one attitude, his opinion was always the opposite of yours. He loved to argue, right? And I can g give him thanks for learning to listen how, how arguments went. Mm -hmm. But when I became a Christian... Uh, surprisingly through reading a textbook by an atheist so I know God's got a great sense of humor he was the first to say you ever get into Christian ministry you're out of the will mm -hmm. and I really had to think now what choice am I making mm -hmm. he's so anti-God he's so anti-creation what about the Bible it's so pro-creation I'm going to have to think this through and so in one sense the same thing happened as with you my father was an apologist for anti-Christian stuff and would defend that sort of stuff. So I had to learn to defend for creation. And it's interesting how God used these totally different backgrounds to put us together. Yeah. And you and I ended up in a Christian ministry, but not just a generic one. Why did you feel so burdened to get involved in a creation-based ministry, not just a generic Christian ministry? Well, you know, it's interesting. When, when I went to high school and I brought home the textbooks, and in the textbooks was presenting evolution as fact, at that stage in my life, when I asked my father, how do I answer this and the millions of years and the ape men, so-called, and all the rest of it, he didn't have those answers. But he, he said to me, that doesn't mean there aren't any. I'm just not an expert in that area. We need to wait for the answers. And it's interesting how then the Lord led to eventually bring along Gordon Jones, who uh, got me to get the book, The Genesis Flood, that gave answers. And so I'd been preparing myself. So when I became a teacher, interestingly, when I went to Dolby, uh, I think it was almost the first day I was there. Students had heard that I was going to be heading up the Christian group, so they knew I was a Christian because I would be head of the Christian group in the school. And so some of the students in one of those first science classes, uh, he put his hand up and said, Sir, we heard you're a Christian. Yes. Well, how can you be a Christian? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the Bible's not true. How do you know the Bible's not true? Because of what our textbooks teach us about evolution and millions of years. And right there... I, I can't explain it except to say it's sort of like what Jeremiah talks about, a fire in your bones. God gave me a fire in my bones as I realized these kids aren't listening to the Bible and the gospel because for them, evolution, millions of years, is a big stumbling block to them even considering uh, that the Bible could be true. And so I had a real burden to start giving answers. And so I continued to do that, to give those answers. And then it was interesting... I came across the book The Genesis Record by Henry Morris and started reading how important the book of Genesis is to all of our doctrine, how foundational it is to the rest of the Bible. And at the same time, I was asked to come and speak at some Bible studies in the town because you know, the, the pastors had heard that I was a Christian, I was a teacher at the school, to have this teacher come and lead a Bible study. And so I started to talk on the importance of the book of Genesis. And I was amazed because most people said, well, we didn't know you could believe Genesis. And this is in the church. We, we thought you had to believe in evolution in millions of years. And so that burden intensified. I also took students to museums. 
I love to take them on field trips, and I know you love to take your students on field trips. And when I would go to those museums and see everything presented from an evolutionary millions of years perspective, again, that burden intensified as God just placed on my heart that burden that, that they, need, they need to be told the truth. And it was, it was because of that that actually the burden and vision for a creation museum came to be as well. And out of that is, is really how the Lord used all those circumstances to lead me into full-time ministry. Mm. And it's interesting how you and I met. In fact, I remember, uh, was it uh, Scripture Union? Was, yes. Is that the name? The Cre study camps yeah, and all of that. And, yes. and they had a Christian group that they looked after in schools mm -hmm. and so on. It was one of their representatives that actually told me about you. And that's how I first heard your name. And then when we moved to Brisbane, my wife and I were in Dolby. I remember we were sitting across the table one day at breakfast and both of us at the same time looked at each other and said, the Lord doesn't want us here anymore in Dolby, even though we love that town. Some of the best friends we've ever made are there. And still have. I and, was out uh, there preaching just a few weeks back. I, I know. We always go back to Dolby to visit them. Those friends are so special to us. And yet we had this burden that we had to leave Dolby. And so we went to Brisbane and then we met up with you and then it was in 1977, wasn't it, that we ran the first a long major time ago. That's uh, right. creation seminar. Uh, you and I got together and we gave different talks and so on and I displayed some of the books I had and you had your books and then people wanted to buy those books. I remember that. They say, where do we get these books from? And that then put a burden on our hearts. We have to import these books. Yeah. And so we started to do that and I remember we put a little room on the front of our house, got a loan to do that, and we put a room on the back of our house and so on and started importing these books. And really, the ministry was, was built initially to, to resource people, mm -hmm. to, to be able to get these materials into people's hands because they didn't have the information. Well, let me tell you why I felt such a burden about the resources, particularly because not coming from a church family, not coming from a, a Christian father, but nevertheless having had to defend anything I believed because my father was mm -hmm. so good at arguing. Um, I get to Brisbane Grammar School, the, which is really an elite private education system, still is the best college in Australia at that level, in the science department. I'd become a Christian, but a very confused one because even my geology professor at university, who claimed to be a Christian a theologian, uh, said, I just say God used millions of years of evolution. And I'd scratch my head and I'd read Genesis and I thought, okay, if that's what the older Christians say, it must be, but it never would make any sense. And then when I'm in the science department, hoping against hope that nobody on the staff or the students will ask me embarrassing questions about Genesis, creation, Noah's flood, because I didn't mm -hmm. know any answers, mm -hmm. right? And I didn't, you know, not like you, I didn't know my way around Christian bookshops or anything. I had a Bible, I had a, com a uh, concordance, and that was my, my tool base. And then one day an evangelist came to me and he said, listen, John, you're in science, you've got to help us. We do, you remember the old survey methods? They'd go and survey right. students and use it as a, a leapfrog to get to the gospel. He said, nine out of 10 of the students are saying, why are you wasting your time trying to tell us about Jesus Christ when we know Adam and Eve aren't true? And he said, I don't know how to answer that. What's the answer? And I went, gulp, I'd better find out. Mm -hmm. So that led to my really, really looking for study, for resources. And there weren't any resources, hardly right. any, right? right? So when God brought you to Brisbane and you and I started running these seminars, yes, making the front of your house a real mess with books and everything and ruining your accommodation, etc. It was a real high priority. It, it really was. And I remember you lived more out in the country uh, area outside Brisbane, although it's not so much the country today as we know, but you, you lived a bit further out, so it made sense that because we live more central mm -hmm. near the city uh, to start uh, the ministry there in that house, and that's what we did. Okay, and I two, two it, questions. It took then, over Ken. our home, actually. It really did take over your home, and, and, and we would spend hours in each other's homes and in, in motor cars traveling around the country. But since you were so sure of God's leading from Dolby to Brisbane, I was so sure of our ministry together. Do you remember or did you notice any significant leading of God in terms of answered prayer when we set the ministry up either there or when you moved to America? Oh, John, there are so many. Just miracles from the Lord. I remember when we, when we first uh, set the ministry up, do you remember when one of the speakers from the Institute for Creation Research was coming out to Australia and he was going to give a, a, a lecture tour in Australia? And that's when we needed some books. We needed some books to be able to take on that lecture tour. And at that time, we didn't have a relationship with 
uh, Creation Life Publishers, they were mm -hmm. called Master Books, they're called now, uh, that published the creation books over here. And we found out that they had an exclusive agency with a distributor in Australia, and that exclusive agency only had a few books. And we were talking about we needed lots of books. We didn't have any money. And so uh, I remember calling them and talking to them and pestering them. And in fact, in those days, we didn't know what to do. I remember getting a Creation Research Quarterly, a magazine from a group of creation scientists in America, and just telegramming all of them and saying, will you call Master Books and tell them we want some books? And they did that, and I remember getting a call from George Hillstead, who was the manager at the time. He'd become a good friend later on. He's with the Lord now. But he called me and said, OK, I've got all these telegram uh, you know, messages from people. You sent these telegrams over here. What, what do you want? And I said, well, you've got an exclusive agency. We need some books. And he said, well, I can't break the exclusive agency. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you one order. You can have one order. And we sat down, and we decided to order books that totaled up, I, I think in those days it was like $20,000. And between us, I think we had like $200. We it was, did. It was something like that. <laughs> Teachers aren't the best so on the planet, are they? What we did, we, we basically uh, sent letters out to people that we knew. People knew, knew, and I knew. And we sat down and wrote this letter and, and said, can you help us with uh, money so we can do this and buy these books and get these books into Australia and so on? And I remember we had like $3,000 to go. And I was sitting on the porch uh, out in, 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 of our home on the veranda at the front. And my wife and I were talking, and I said, I don't know how we're going to get $3,000 to us back then. And, you know, it was, it was a fortune. Mm. And we're sitting there wondering, what, what shall we do? And we've been praying to the Lord. And then a car drove up, and it was a, a man who was a member of a church that, that we'd spoken at and that had supported us. And he walked out of the car, and he said, the Lord's given me a burden to give you a check to help you to get these materials into Australia, and gave us a check for $3,000. I'll never forget that. Yeah, they're uh, just amazing I, incidences, I, aren't they? I remember a time when we were sitting in our offices <coughs> and we were with our board and we needed a vehicle so we could travel around Australia and, and be able to uh, distribute books and speak at programs. Because, you know, in Australia there's so many country churches, you can't just fly to big cities all over the place. I mean, you can fly to some, but uh, in those days it was to reach people. You had to just go church after church after church. I remember I'd drive all night. Uh, sometimes you and I would do it mm -hmm. together. Um, you would drive all night, speak in a church, and then pack up there and drive all night and speak. Now, I don't know how we did that in those days. I couldn't do it today. But I, I remember we needed this vehicle, and the one we had looked at was, uh, I think it was about $12,000, and it was down to the used car yard uh, not far away, and we just didn't have that sort of money. And then there was a man who later became one of our board members too who called us up and said, hey, I, I've got some extra funds and just wondering if you could use it. It was right when we were talking about it and praying about it, and it was the exact amount we needed for that vehicle. So I, I've seen a lot of answers to prayer like that over the years. Well, I'll tell you what, what strikes me in this is, is two things that always leap to my mind when, when, when this issue comes up. And you and I remember going to the big Presbyterian conference in Toowoomba trying mm -hmm. to raise funds. Now, mm -hmm. with a name like Mackay and a background in Scotland, mm -hmm. you know, Presbyterians <laughs> are not the most generous people right. on the planet, but God used that meeting to teach us how to rely on him rather than people. Because I remember dear old Mrs. White, who'd been a missionary in China, and you and I had pleaded our hearts out to this large congregation. You know, we need money to start up this ministry. It's absolutely necessary, and you could see it didn't register at all with most people. And she came up all five foot two of her and stared me in the navel and said, you know, if God has called you to do this, don't you think you'd better go and do it? Don't worry about the money. God will pick up the tab. And I still remember how many times God has actually done exactly that. Well, you know, and you mentioning that just brought to mind something else too. Do you remember the time we were at a convention in Warwick? Mm -hmm. I think it was called Kingswood. Yes. And... We were there, and there was a speaker from New Tribes Mission, I think. Harry, uh, Harry West. M Harry, Harry West. Mitten? No, no, Harry West. I Harry West. Is, yeah. uh, anyway, whoever it Harry was. Harry somebody. It was Harry somebody. <laughs> uh, and from New Tribes Mission. And we were struggling at the time because we knew one of us had to go full-time. The ministry was getting so busy. Uh, one of us had to go full-time. We just couldn't keep on the way we were. I couldn't keep, you know, doing school teaching during the day and packing up books and sending them out, you know, at night. We, we, we did everything. We were the warehouse mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, getting the, the mail ready and things like that and speaking and t answering the phone. And we, we couldn't continue to do all that. The ministry had taken over our house as well. And I, I remember he had heard about this and we talked to him. And then out of the blue, 
I remember at one of the sessions, he just looked at us and said, uh, when are you going to go full-time? Because the Lord is calling you to go full-time. Mm. And it was in 1979 when I went full-time and left school teaching. And even that, there were all sorts of interesting miracles associated with that because when I told the school I was going to resign, they said, you can't do that. This is, you know, during the year. We're not going to be able to find another teacher. And, and then suddenly, out of the blue, a teacher called up and said they wanted a job at that school, uh, exactly the position that I was in. And then I was told, well, you can resign. That's fine. We've got a teacher to replace mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. And then I put in my resignation, and then that other teacher pulled out. Yeah. And then comes that time of testing. You know, Does that mean right. I, I should continue with this, or should I go back, or whatever? And I thought, no, we've made that decision before the Lord, move ahead, and then prayed that God will, would bring a teacher to fill that position, which is exactly what happened. Well, I remember at that time I was not only you know, involved in the science department, I was also lecturing in geology for technical education, so I had a big income. And with a name like Mackay, where you count all the pennies you can, uh-huh. <laughs> trying to make a decision to go full-time is a hard one. You know, what will it cost us? And then there's Mrs. White and there's Harry West. And, and you think, well, God is leading, lead, led you first and then led me. And I've remembered from then on the principle that if God calls you to do it, he will provide. And even the first time I came to the USA, I remember a pastor gave me a call from somewhere in the middle of, um, what's one of your northern states? Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And he said, I feel God is calling you to come here, but I do have to warn you of one thing. What's that? I haven't got any money. We're in the middle of a, it's a farming community, it's a drought, I cannot pay your airfare, I cannot pay you anything for being here, there's no money. And I said, well, let me pray about it, and if God wants us there, I'll be there. And he said, but I can't give you anything. I said, just feed and water, that'll be fine. And I remember praying, and my wife and I prayed, and one of the other pastors prayed, and we were really convinced that was where we should be buying your air ticket, thinking, how much is this going to cost, you know? So we ended up there, and the first day I arrived, I got a phone call from Australia. And it's my wife saying, guess what? And she'd she'd not known anything about how serious the situation was here. I said, what, darling? She said, we just got a check for $10,000. I said, don't tell me. Here, tell the pastor. And he was just so overjoyed that he didn't have it, but God already knew that. Right. Jehovah Jireh provided for you when you moved here, for me. It, it, it's just been a principle. Change the subject slightly. Um, was this just a John Mackay, Ken Ham thing in the beginning, or did God lead us to bring others? You've already mentioned Steve Gustafson. Uh, do you remember some of the other board members we built in? Because you and I don't know everything. We needed right. some advisors. Well, I remember when we first set up the ministry, we sort of set up as a bookshop. I think we called mm-hmm. it Creation Science Supplies. Educational Baptist, Media Services. And then there was that one as well, <laughs> Creation Science Education media services which is not a great marketing name it's so long people would never remember it but but we set that up and and then I remember Steve Gustafs and the attorney saying look you really need to set this up more formally and have a board of directors to whom you're accountable and so I remember us talking about that and inviting people on one of the special people that was invited on that board uh, who's still such a special friend to both of us uh, this day is John Thallon Mm -hmm. and John Thallon in fact John John was at one as a board member who knelt down with me on a piece of property between Brisbane and the Gold Coast and we prayed that the Lord would let us build a creation museum. Mm. And I still remember that day when I knelt down with John. And God answered that prayer, but many years later in America, in Northern Mm -hmm. Kentucky, Mm -hmm. as as you can see uh, here. But there were others that we invited on too. I remember Dr. John Osgood Mm -hmm. uh, was a board member. He's still such a great friend to this day. Uh, and, and Steve Gustafson, and who else was on that, that early board? Well, what, the one that stands out to me is particularly helpful when we deal with a criticism, oh, you people are just amateurs, uh-huh. or you're theologians or whatever. And I remember Professor Rendell Short, right. you know, oh. very famous ha- in the scientific ha- regime, yeah. uh, medical expert, par expert, and uh, he came to one of our first conferences and basically came up afterwards and said, I'm convinced. He'd struggled forever with evolution versus mm-hmm. creation and then offered his services. And so Prof became one of our most prestigious, well-published scientific men, a man of international repute. And in reality, what was interesting is that none of these guys were in essence from the same type of church. No, God was using it right across the board, from uh, whether they were Baptists or Presbyterians. Their first commitment was to Jesus Christ. And you know, Prof... Uh, was our founding chairman of, of that ministry that was known as the Creation Science Foundation. And as the founding chairman, he was such a great statesman and such a wonderful man of God. And uh, Prof uh, passed away just a few years ago. 
but he and his wife were such dear friends and we often visited them when we went back to Australia uh, even in you know as they were getting more elderly and they still love uh, mm. for Mally my wife and I to visit them but Prof also you know he was honored by the Queen mm -hmm. for his work on autism he pioneered the research in regard to autism in Australia and so he was, uh, he was a very famous man uh, for that and he, I remember he said that he really started to believe in six literal days when he met uh, the late Dr. A. E. Wildersmith. Mm -hmm. We even had Dr. Wildersmith come to That's Australia right. for one of our That's conferences. Right. And he was a great man of God, three earned doctorates mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And he, he said uh, that he nearly, you know, basically even fell off his chair when he heard Dr. Wildersmith <laughs> say that he believed in six literal days of creation. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes. Because he had grown up in a home that had taught theistic evolution. Mm -hmm. Very and, famous home in England. Uh, and very, yeah. Yes, very famous. He had a very famous father who was a doctor in England. But, you know, Prof really loved our ministry and what, what a great person he was. Let's just take a break here, folks, so you can read on the banners how you can get in touch with either Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis in the USA or Creation Research, myself, John Mackay, the Creation Guy, and we'll be back shortly. G'day again and uh, welcome back to this interview between the Creation Guy John Mackay and the President and CEO of Answers in Genesis, Ken Ham. Now, Ken, people have often asked me, you're Australian, I'm Australian, uh -huh. how come so many creationists come out of Australia? And my common answer has been, well, it must be because God's got a great sense of humour and the evolutionists may think they can explain parrots, but trying to explain a platypus with a bill like a duck and a body like an otter and a tail like a beaver and claws like a chicken, lays eggs like a turtle, uh, they're stuck. So do you have any funny things that have happened to you that are related to this ministry that really make a teaching point as well? Uh, by the way, before I give you those, John, uh, it's interesting. I think there's another reason why so many creationists come from Australia. Yeah. And it's because Americans just love the Australian accent and so do other <laughs> people around the world. In fact, I remember when I first came to America, Crocodile Dundee was really popular mm -hmm. at that stage. Throw another and, shrimp on uh, the barbie. Yeah, yeah. and Americans love Crocodile Dundee. At that stage I had dark hair and a darker beard. And so people told me I look more like Abraham Lincoln. And so I had people an announcing me in churches as, here's our speaker today. He sounds like Crocodile Dundee and looks like Abraham Lincoln. So I had the best of both worlds there. <laughs> and I've had people in America tell me, you know what, it doesn't matter what you say. We just love to hear you saying it yeah, <laughs> because of the accent. Too. So maybe the Lord uses that. I think he has actually used that Australian accent in a, in a special way because it sort of stands out mm -hmm. uh, in a way too. But yeah, so a couple of funny things have happened that relate to teaching. Aspect. Let me give you two, Just because it makes a point about why we do what we do. We're an apologetics ministry, right? We're answering mm -hmm. questions. I remember one of the things that happened at school was when a student put up his hand and said, Sir, Noah's Ark couldn't be true. Why not? Well, he couldn't fit all those animals on board. Okay, son, well, how many animals did he need to put on, fit on board? Well, I don't know, sir, but he couldn't have fitted them. Well, what size was the ark? Well, I don't know, sir, but there's no way it could have happened. And you realize that student has a problem with mathematics, right? An unknown number of animals can't yeah. fit in an unknown size ark. Yeah. And as I say to people, it's even worse when they ask, how did Moses get all them animals on the ark? <laughs> <laughs> Which I had some of them uh, ask me. But it, it, it reinforces the fact that people have questions. And if we can't answer their questions, they think, see, it can't be true. Mm -hmm. I remember once when I was over in London, in England. And this was in the early days when I did some tours in England speaking as well. I still go there today and speak. But we're at a Brazilian restaurant. And I'll never forget it because the chef found out we're doing a creation conference nearby. And so he came over to the table and, and, and he said, you, you're, you're speaking on the Bible? Yes. You believe the Bible? Well, yes, we do. Why? He said, well, I don't believe the Bible. I said, oh, why not? He said, well, the Bible says that uh, Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. Then where do all the people come from then? Uh, you know, where did Cain get his wife? You know? uh, and, and I said, well, Genesis 5, 4 says Adam had sons and daughters. And he looked at me and he said, oh, I didn't read that far. <laughs> and that's a problem with a lot of people. They don't read that far. They don't read yeah. their Bibles. But here's a point I want to make. You know, as I've traveled around the world in the last 35 years and traveled to many, many different countries, when people hear you speaking on the Bible or you believe Genesis or you're doing a conference associated with that in some way, they ask questions. And it doesn't matter what country you're in, where you are, 
you get the same basic questions. How do you know there's a God? Where did God come from? Wait a minute, hasn't science disproved the Bible? How to know if it all the animals on the ark? But there's no evidence for a flood. Doesn't carbon-14 disprove the Bible? You believe in Adam and Eve? Where did Cain get his wife? How do you explain all the races of people if we go back mm -hmm. to Adam and Eve? Dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. They disproved the Bible. What about all the ape men? And you see, when I today, even in churches, say, put up your hand if you've heard those questions, most hands go up. Mm -hmm. And I say, the reason your hands go up is because that's what I call the Genesis 3 attack of our day. Did God really say, Genesis mm -hmm. 3? The attack that's associated with the teaching of evolution millions of years has caused generations of people to doubt that you can trust the Bible. And then they have all these questions. The trouble is, in many churches, instead of giving answers to the next generation, training them up to be able to defend the Christian faith. A lot of them have said, well, we don't know. It doesn't matter anyway. Who cares? J trust in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And two-thirds of young people in America are walking away from the church by the time they reach college age. In England, two-thirds of teenagers say they don't believe in God. Church attendance is down from 60% to about 7% yes, in England. 4,000 churches are closing their doors each year in America. Three million people a year are converting to what they would call secularism or nominalism in America. And what's happened is generations of kids have not been trained in their churches and Christian homes to defend the Christian faith, been giving answers to these attacks of this age. So that's one of the reasons why, and I've seen this as I've traveled around the world, so many people asking questions. I, I remember even once I was in the middle of Ohio somewhere and stopped at a at a gas station, petrol station, translate for Australians, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in the middle of the night and I was putting petrol in the car and I noticed the guy that was inside uh, who was you know, there at the cash register was looking at us and then he came out and he said, I think I've seen you on video or something. And I said, yeah. Uh, he said, do you talk about creation? I said, yeah, I do. He said, oh, look, I've always wanted to know, where did Cain get his wife? <laughs> I think I've been asked that question more than any other question yeah. uh, as, as we travel. But it, it's this whole emphasis on they have questions and we yes. need to give them answers. Well, you're right about the internationalness of these questions because I was doing some research on a little island off the coast of South America and I'm just giving you the, the way the lady asked the question. She was a big, big black lady, ex-slave background, brought over by the French, etc. family, been there for a long time. And the missionary on the island asked me, would I run a meeting? And I said, sure. She puts up a hand and she said, but sir, if Adam was a black man, how did you white folks get in on this? <laughs> Same question. Same, yeah. And then just a couple of weeks ago, to bring it right up to date, was a brilliant illustration as to why a place like this museum needs to exist. A little girl, three to four years of age, and it's a family that's adopted me over the years, and they live out in the country, and she's taking me around showing me all her farm animals, the turkeys and the dogs and the chickens, and there's a couple of sheep dogs eating the bones of an old goat. And she says, Grandpa John... Where's your mummy? And I said, well, sadly, my mummy got old and she got sick and she died. And she looks up to me and she said, did you have to shoot her? Because <laughs> our cow got old and sick and Dad had to shoot her. And I thought, ooh, how do we teach that girl mm -hmm. the difference between shooting the old cow right. and shooting the old girl? And in fact, that's why you've got places like this museum set up, haven't you, to, to start by saying, OK, man is not just an animal. Man is made in the image of God. The Question, Ken. Yeah. When people come to this museum, what can they actually see? What, what use is it in Christian evangelism? What, what evidence can they see here? The floor's yours. You know, it's interesting. In Luke 24, I remember Jesus was crucified, raised from the dead, and he appeared with the two on the road to Emmaus, and they didn't recognize who he was. And then it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, they expounded unto them, they expounded unto them and all the scriptures and things concerning himself. Jesus began with the writings of Moses, and the very first book in the writings of Moses, of course, uh, is the book of Genesis. What we do here at Answers in Genesis is that we present the gospel the way God does it in the Bible. Now, wait till you hear this. Is gonna, you're going to fall off your seat, John, when you hear well, this. Well, probably not me. Okay, this is so <laughs> radical. This is so radical. You're not going to believe this. We present the gospel the way God does it in the Bible by starting at the beginning. Isn't that a radical wow, idea? Wow, that's really well, important, Ken. Because if, if you think about it, why would Jesus begin with Moses to explain the things concerning himself? Well, think of what we read in Romans 5.12. By one man, sin entered the world. Where did we read about the first man? Genesis 1, Genesis 2. We read about the creation of Adam. 
and sin entered the world, Genesis 3, and death came because of sin, and, and, and Genesis 3. So, so they can so, walk all through this history at the museum? What we do is we walk them through the history of the world. Actually, people, it's called Creation Museum, and people come here, a lot of people are surprised, they say, but it's, it's not just about creation evolution. It's a walk through the Bible. It's a walk through the Bible with a particular emphasis. We actually call it the seven C's, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, and that's the first four C's. That's really the history in Genesis 1 to 11, the geological, biological, astronomical, anthropological history, uh, the creation account, uh, the, the entrance of sin and death, the fall, corruption, the flood account. If there really was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth, which is what you find. Confusion, Tower of Babel, God gave different languages forming the different people groups. Then Christ's cross consummation, the gospel that's based in that history. And because that history in Genesis has come under particular attack in today's world, as you walk through, we're countering those attacks. We're giving people answers. So they can actually and see evidence and fossils and historic documents ex and all e that. Exactly. And, and we're giving them those answers to those skeptical questions. And we do it in a unique way here because this is done very professionally, first class. Uh, we have a life-size exhibit so you actually see Adam and Eve. You can actually walk through 1% of Noah's Ark. You'll see life-size dinosaurs, not real ones of course. A lot of, we have real bones and real dinosaur eggs but lots of sculptures of dinosaurs. We're walking people through the history of the world and as we walk them through, we help them understand the history is true. That's why the gospel based in this history is true. When we get to the Tower of Babel, we talk about skin color, for instance, help people understand we're all basically the same color, just different shades uh, of that color. So it, it, I've read the media and the, a common criticism is Nothing's been added since you first opened, but yet I've been here year after year. What are some of the newer things you've added in the last couple of years? Well, John, if I can say this, the Creation Museum continues to evolve every year. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that's widely known. <laughs> that's the right usage of the word, right? Actually, since the Creation Museum, is, when it first opened, we didn't have our two-story dinosaur exhibit. Now we have a two-story dinosaur exhibit with life-size dinosaur models and a whole account of the history of dinosaurs according to the Bible. Uh, we didn't have a naturalist selection exhibit. We've added in a beautiful natural selection exhibit uh, in our flood geology room. Uh, we just recently added a world-class insect exhibit. When I say world-class, it is world-class insect exhibit. Insects from an evangelistic perspective. Now, you have to go down there to see it to understand that, but they really are. It really are. bugs some of the atheists, uh, they, I believe. That, that's for sure. It, bug, it really does bug them. But uh, some of these insects are as big as your hand. Actually, the man that collected them, his name is Dr. Crawley, so we called it Dr. Crawley's Insectorium. But it's a world-class collection that any major museum would be very envious of when, no. when you see it. And then we've also added a Dragon Legends exhibit mm -hmm. and a mm -hmm. manuscript exhibit. Oh, there many things have been added. Yeah, I saw that as I came in today. And There's currently a, a big project, you're doing a rather unique, a different, a controversial, a, uh, an unusual model of Noah's Ark and the Tower of Babel, etc. Tell us about that and what it's for. Well, we stepped out in faith to rebuild Noah's Ark, the size of the Ark, out of wood, as a real boat, uh, so that people can walk through full size? three for full size, about 500 feet long and about uh, 80 feet wide, 50 feet high, three stories. It's the size of a... So that's about 150 metres or so. Uh, oh, yeah, yes. I should translate for <laughs> the people who are more advanced in, in, in their use of uh, measurement. But it, it, it's uh, actually going to be the size of a six-story building. Mm -hmm. and it's going to be built 12 feet off the ground, and the Lord has enabled us to obtain 800 acres right at an interchange on Interstate 75, which is one of the busiest north-south interstates in the whole of America, going from Canada all the way down to Florida. Incredible piece of property. And we, we, all, we did a survey. We actually had America's research group go out and do a properly, proper, uh, you know, statistically valid survey, uh, a general population study. Uh, how many would come to the ark if we really rebuilt Noah's ark? And, you know, to cut through all the different things that they found and so on, they predict about two million people a year would come to Noah's Ark. Uh, that's an incredible... We, we get over a quarter of a million each year to the Creation Museum, but about uh, uh, two million a year, and they believe it would double the number of people coming to the Creation Museum. We also asked in, in that study what questions would people want answered and we're going to answer those, such as how do you fit all the animals on the ark? In fact, we have researchers well, how right now... how did the now, kangaroos get from Australia? Yeah, the questions like that. We, we have researchers right now who have been doing a lot of research around the world on how many actual land animal kinds were needed on Noah's ark. And it's 
fascinating because, you know, uh, even here at the Creation Museum, the petting zoo, we have camels and llamas and alpacas to help people understand there's a camel kind and they're all part of the kind. So you only need two of the camel kind on Noah's Ark. We have the zebroids, we have the zoars. Yeah, you have the crossed ones, and, don't you? Yes, right. and, and the, the, uh, z the z donk uh, here as well as donkeys and so on. Uh, to help people understand there's a horse kind and only two of the horse kind were needed. So they've been doing this research around the world. Surprisingly, it looks like they're predicting right now, they haven't got all the papers done, they've got some of them, but they believe probably less than a thousand animal kinds needed on Noah's Ark, which means far fewer animals than people, people realize on the, on the Ark. So we're going to answer those sorts of questions good, and how to look after them. And there's an evangelistic emphasis. As Noah and his family had to go through a door to be saved, we need to go through a door. Jesus Christ said, I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he'll be saved. So even the whole Noah's Ark uh, replica that, that we're building, the, the, uh, building it the size of the Ark in, as it was given in the Bible there, even that is going to have an evangelistic emphasis. So what you and I noticed years ago in Australia and then around the world, if people dismiss God's judgment in Noah's day, they have no fear of a God who will judge at the end of time. Let me ask you a political question, Ken. Um, just as I drove up here, I picked up the press and there's a critical article about you at the museum, etc., saying, oh, people's interest has dropped off, funding has dropped off, you're going bankrupt, etc. And this is reported <laughs> even in the Christian press. Do you want to just give us a minute or so on, on what's motivating this or what the reality is? Actually, that particular Christian publication got their information from a very left-wing, uh, non-Christian source. And it's interesting to note that, you know, the atheists can't counter our arguments, so they attack in all sorts of ways. And this is just another one of the attacks of the atheists. They think maybe this will undermine the Creation Museum and the Answers in Genesis ministry, and they're spreading these untruths about that. Actually, our biggest year was the opening year, which we fully expected. And since then, we've been above projections in attendance. We've been above projections uh, in our funding, and we're just absolutely thrilled with the way everything is going. So... Contrary to what uh, the atheists want to believe out there and want people to believe, uh, the Creation Museum is doing very well. I'm sure that'll be sad news for the atheists. <laughs> I usually pop in here once a year or so. And last year when I was here, we shared about our museum in Australia. We shared it with the staff. Australia, of course, is a different place than the USA. We don't get all the tax deductible breaks or anything right. like that. But we've set up a museum called Jurassic Ark, you know, as in Jurassic mm -hmm. Park, mm -hmm. no apologies. Mm -hmm. But Jurassic, of course, is a word that came from the Jura Mountains, nothing to do with millions of years. And we set it up to show people that you really can recognize both the remnant evidence of creation and the destructive evidence of the flood. Welcome back to our interview between Ken Ham, the executive here in uh, Answers in Genesis in Kentucky in the USA, and John Mackay, the creation die from Down Under, who's up over this week. Uh, Ken, over the years there's been lots of criticisms of groups like ICR or AIG or Creation Research, and uh, I'm going to deal with two of them. And the first is that you're a bunch of amateurs. You don't really have real scientists doing research. Now, how do you deal with that criticism? Well, that's easy, John. Not only do we work with a lot of real scientists out there in the field, uh, we have people like Dr. David DeWitt, who's head of science at Liberty University, who's one of our good friends, and he helps us with research and writing papers and so on. And there's lots of people like that who are out there uh, in the culture. But not only that, we also have full-time scientists here at Answers in Genesis and the Creation Museum. For instance, Dr. Andrew Snelling heads up our research department. Now, he happens to be an Australian, got a PhD. We've known Andrew for a uh, long time in, since he was a young man, haven't that's we? That's right. He got a PhD in geology from Sydney University, and he's one of the world's leading uh, creation geologists. We also have Dr. Georgia Purdom. She has a PhD in molecular biology from Ohio State University. Uh, we also have Dr. David Menton. Now, Dr. Mm -hmm. David Menton uh, actually taught anatomy at Washington University School of Medicine for uh, people who are training to be doctors, but he has a PhD from Brown University. And we have uh, Dr. Tommy Mitchell here at Answers in Genesis. Now, he's a medical doctor. He was an internist. Uh, but we also have uh, other scientists associated with uh, the ministry uh, as well. And uh, Dr. Danny Faulkner, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, PhD in astronomy. He taught at Secular University for many years as a professor. And now he's full-time here at Answers in Genesis. So I could go on and on and list yeah. all sorts of people yeah. like that. Well, this, this, of course, is a common criticism. And what it strikes me is that 
it's really absolutely false because we've released a DVD where I interview Professor Ed Nealand, who's a professor of synthetic chemistry, and he's been bold enough to say, listen, the evidence says I can't believe in millions of years because I have to put these molecules together and I have to be really quick because otherwise they fall apart. There's no right. way it can happen by accident. So we interviewed him in an amazing design of life, and the interesting thing is people say there's no real scientist, but he's a widely published scientist, and you've got the same, and, and so this is absolutely fallacious criticism. Oh, it certainly is. The second thing I want to ask you about, Ken, is it's not actually a university-type-based academic criticism, but it's widespread in the Christian ministries on campus. It's very widespread in the theological colleges that this is interesting, but it's irrelevant. Creation, Noah's flood, it's just not a gospel issue. Forget about it. How do you cope with that? John, here's what I say. First of all, it is not a salvation issue, but it is an authority issue, and it is a gospel issue. Let me explain. You know, in Romans... We read, if you confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It doesn't say, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead and believe in six literal days in a young earth, you'll be saved. In other words, salvation is conditioned upon faith in Christ, not what you believe about the age of the earth or evolution. Then there are people who say to me, so you can believe in millions of years and still be a Christian. Well, I know many people who are Christians who believe in millions of years. You can believe in evolution and still be a Christian. Well, I know that there are people who believe in evolution and they're still Christians. And they say to me, well, then it doesn't matter. Yes, it does, because it's an authority issue and it's a gospel issue. You know, in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, God through Paul has a warning for us. To paraphrase, I want to warn you, Satan's going to use the same method on you as he did on Eve to get you to a position of not believing the things of God. What was the method he used on Eve? Genesis 3, 1. Did God really say... The first attack was on the Word of God. It was to get people to doubt the Word of God, and that doubt would lead to unbelief. The point I want to make is there's been an attack on the Word of God ever since Genesis 3. See, the first attack was on the Word of God. The point that we have to understand is this. That attack manifests itself in different ways in different eras of history. And so what I say to people, what is the Genesis 3 attack today that causes people to doubt you can trust God's Word and that doubt lead to unbelief? I suggest the teaching of evolution, millions of years, is that attack. Because we have generations of kids who have been told, even by many of their pastors in their churches, you don't have to believe in six days. You can reinterpret the flood. You can reinterpret the creation count. You can add man's ideas of evolution of millions of years in. Trust in Jesus. And see, the average Christian says, well, that's not an attack on the gospel because it's not an attack on the resurrection. And my point is, look, Satan knows if you attack the resurrection, most Christians would be astute enough to recognize that's an attack on the gospel, Right. But the attack is more subtle and more powerful in a sense. The attack is on the word from which the gospel comes. And the point we want to make is that when you have generations of kids in our churches have been told you can reinterpret Genesis according to what man says out here, it creates that doubt, it unlocks that door that you don't have to believe this part of the Bible. It unlocks that door that you can take man's ideas and reinterpret God's word. And just to make a point here too, John, there are people that say, but you can have different views of eschatology and different views of baptism and different views of Sabbath day and speaking in tongues, and you can have different views of Genesis, same thing, but it's not. By and large, when you're arguing about eschatology, baptism, speaking in tongues, Sabbath day, whatever, by and large, we're arguing from the Scripture. It might be your view of Ezekiel or Daniel or Revelation, your view of the church, your view of circumcision, whatever it is. The reason we have different views of Genesis is because we're taking the secular views of the age, adding it to the Bible, reinterpreting the Bible. And the point I want to make is it's an authority issue because it's undermining the authority of the Word of God. And it's a gospel issue because if you believe in millions of years, then you've got death, bloodshed, disease, suffering millions of years before mm -hmm. sin. When the Bible makes it very clear, it's our sin that causes this whole world to groan in pain. Originally, the animals were vegetarian. God said everything he made was very good. In the fossil record, you got evidence of brain tumors, diseases like cancer and arthritis. If God called all that very good, if that existed millions of years before man, and if death existed millions of years before man, then death is not the penalty for sin. The first death was in the garden when God killed an animal uh, which is very obvious in the context there, he gave coats of skins to Adam and Eve, the first blood sacrifice as a covering for their sin. But if death and bloodshed existed before sin, what has death and bloodshed got to do with the atonement? Mm -hmm. And so it, it is an important issue. And if, if we don't 
stand on the authority of God's Word in Genesis and we allow generations of people to be taught, you can reinterpret it. What's going to happen? You're going to increasingly see generations of kids walking away from the church church. and you'll see the collapse of any Christian structure that existed, which is exactly what we're seeing. Three things that strike me about this. I've been ministering in churches uh, on this trip here in the USA. A big change since I first came 20 or 30 years ago. In fact, the pastor I was with just last Wednesday said our whole group from 18 to 35 is missing. And he said the reason is they no longer believe in the authority of Scripture. There's point one. Point number two, I recently got an email request from a church in Western Australia or from a person in the church and said, help please, I'm trying to get you into our church, but the elders tell me they don't believe in six days of creation, but they want God to do things straight away when we pray. And he said, how how can you help me? And you can see, hey, the older you make the world, the smaller you make your Jesus. Mm -hmm. The bigger you make the age of the planet, the less authority Jesus actually has. And the third one is the reverse. I was really delighted last year. I was running a meeting to gypsies. Now, these are not normal meetings. They're pretty noisy, right? Mm -hmm. We're in England. And uh, this young man comes up to me afterwards. He's called Sam. And uh, I wouldn't have known him from a bar of soap, but he introduced himself as Sam Jenkins. And he said, I came to your meeting two years ago. Yes. And he said, I came as an atheist. And why did you come? Well, if evolution was true, you should have been nonsense. I should have been able to demolish everything you said. I said, well, how did you go? He said, well, I left as an agnostic. I couldn't find anything wrong with what you had to say. And he said, two weeks later, after I thought about it, I couldn't resist the claims of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he told us exactly the truth about six days, just as he tells us the truth about salvation, just as he tells us the truth about, as it was in Noah's day, there is coming a judgment. So you're quite right. You get rid of this end, and the rest of the Bible falls apart. One last question for the day, Ken. You and I have a combined seminar coming up in September next year in the Mm -hmm. UK. Mm -hmm. Now, I've known you for a long time, you've known me for a long time, and both of us have a burden for not only the world, but the UK in particular. Why do you have a burden for places like the UK? Well, John, for me it would be three reasons, okay? First of all, my ancestors on my father's side come from England. Real my, hams. <laughs> my ancestors on my mother's side come from Belfast in Northern Ireland. So, you know, sort of have our, our roots uh, in the UK. Uh, and, and that's one reason. Uh, secondly, because really it was what happened in the UK, it was what happened in England that's really caused a problem in the church around the world. Because what happened was that when the idea of millions of years was popularized back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and it really came out of naturalism, it really came out of deists and atheists and others who were trying to explain things without God, that what happened was there were leaders in the church that said, oh, we'll accept the millions of years and add into the Bible, make a gap between 1-1 one, one and 1-2 one, in Genesis or add into the days of creation. Then along comes Darwin who popularizes evolution and leaders in the church say, we'll say God used evolution. And then along came uh, the Big Bang, you know, Sir Fred Hoyle coined the term the Big Bang and there are people that say, oh, we can use the Big Bang and say God did it. Really that compromise that's so rife in our church today really started out of England, if you like, and sort of spread to America, spread to other parts of the world. And so I I really feel a burden to go there and challenge the church in that country to return to the authority of the Word of God. And that's a country where Darwin is buried in the foundation of a church. In Westminster Uh, Abbey. Abbey, That's right. And it is there in the floor of the church. And it reminds me of Psalm 11.3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Here's a man that really popularized a philosophy to destroy the foundations of the church, the foundation of the authority of the Word of God, honored by the church and buried in the foundation of a church. But the third reason is this. Remember we talked about our founding chairman in Australia of Mm -hmm. our ministry over there many, many years ago, Professor John Reynolds Short. He's with the Lord now. Well, Professor... uh, Uh, John Reynolds Short had such a burden for his home country of England. He came from England to Australia and he was so burdened for that country and burdened that so many of the Christian leaders believed in evolution in millions of years. And he pleaded with me many times and he said, Ken, will you you promise me that you'll do your best to influence uh, my homeland uh, with this message to get them back to the authority of God's word in Genesis? And I made a pledge. Uh, to Prof, we called him. That was our, exactly our name for him. him. I made a pledge to Prof that I would do that, and I want to keep that pledge. 
Of course, you may remember Prof spoke very precisely on all of that, and I still remember Prof saying to me, because I had a much more broad Australian accent, and so did you in those days, and he said, you'll never succeed in England with with an accent like that, John. (laughs) Well, folks, if you're in England and you want to know when Ken and I will be there next, yes, I've got a burden there too. Both of us have preached in some of the, the big churches there that are now sadly dwindling because of the influence of anti-authoritative, pro-Darwinian, undermine the scriptures uh, attitudes that are widespread in universities, colleges, and sadly theological colleges. We'll be there next September. We'll be there next September. They can spot it on your website. And be on our website. I'm sure it'll be on it'll your be website. On our website too. Now, Ken, we've mentioned Alan Cosgrove, a Baptist pastor for many years. So I think he was head of missions in New South Wales for a long time. He's recently been retired, and I've preached for him on and off over the years in Australia. And I remember one of our last conversations, it was a sad conversation, because he said, John, in the last 20 years or so, the number of Baptist churches, which traditionally, of course, stood for the Word of God, evangelical, etc., the number of Baptist churches that have dropped their stand on, taking a stand on Genesis as authoritative, he said it's probably dropped down to about 10%. Now, how does that affect you as an Aussie what sort of burden does that give you to come to Australia and help us preach and teach, etc. there? Well, John, I, I have a real burden for my home country of Australia. I know my, a lot of the creation resources we have here in the U.S. need to be made available there. And, I, you know, I, I was thinking, imagine if we were to team up for a reunion tour or something like that in Let's Australia. Let's do it. I think we need to make a real impact in the churches there. One of the things that I have seen and from what I've heard too, I, I think so many churches don't understand the importance of this issue, why it matters. You know, it's one thing for people to talk about heavy science and all the rest of it, but if we don't get them to understand how important this is to the authority of Scripture and to the gospel and to why we're losing generations of young people from the church, as we see through our whole Western world, you know, it, it's going to continue to decline like that. So I have such a burden to, hey, let's do something really big in Australia. Well, at the moment, Folks can get some of your DVDs and some of your materials through creationresearch.net. It's time that got a little bit bigger as well, hey? It is. I, I, I think we can do something. We have so much available here, like our whole Sunday school program for kindergarten through adult three-year uh, program that's apologetics and biblical authority and chronological. We have all sorts of other apologetics programs for different ages. A lot of resources. I know you distribute some of them over there, Mm -hmm. but how about now we make a way of getting those in a big way through the whole of Australia. Let's make a big impact. Thanks for watching. It's been a great time with Ken Ham and myself. And uh, keep looking at the websites that follow up now and get in touch and support both of us as we minister around the world on the truth of God's Word from Genesis right the way through to Revelation. 